Thank you for inviting me and thanks to everybody of the team at VISP for setting this up and also to Bergen Assembly for lending us this great, um, great place. Um, my talk, as I like said, will mainly focus on uh, portfolio presentation. Um, we might uh, have a sort of follow-up at some point where I go into sort of other details of re being represented by uh, a gallery, but one thing I'm going to try and end on in my half-hour presentation is pricing your work and consignment agreements um, and also archiving your work. Um, the reason why I'm doing that is that um, the, the main kind of tool when working with commercial galleries from an artist's perspective is not necessarily an artist contract, it's a consignment agreement. Because if you are going into an artist contract, you will be kind of probably presented the contract by the gallery. And it's also a very kind of fixed thing because it tends to cover um, lots of uh, legal aspects that are maybe binding for a longer term, whereas a consignment agreement gives an artist power. So uh, I'll go into that a little bit later, but that's why I'm going to talk about those, those things in relation to um, get working with galleries. Um, so, I was like, you can do the next slide. I just thought I'd uh, choose a few um, kind of uh, books about uh, being an artist. Uh, I've chosen two which are kind of really practical uh, books about being an artist uh, and two which are kind of a bit more um, reflective, poetic or a bit fun. So um, this one by Jerry Saltz is quite good. Um, it's very humorous. Uh, I would read it. All of these books, take them with a pinch of salt. Don't treat them as your Bible. Definitely not because there's lots of problems with all four of them. And there will always be problems with, uh, with these type of books. Um, but uh, this I enjoyed and I thought that he had some good points throughout it and, and it's also quite good fun as well. So uh, I'd like if we go for the next one. And this is a very poetic book. This is by Michael Craig Martin, uh, an artist who was also um, a very important educator. Uh, he's originally from Ireland but grew up in America, educated in America and then taught in the UK. So he's one of the key reasons why the Young British Artists Movement took off uh, back in the 90s. Uh, his education was very formative for all of them. And he's written this book relatively recently and it's really easy to digest. It's, he just says, on being a student, on being uh, a painter, on being... So every section of the book is on being something and it's very poetic it's very uh, much uh, like a biography looking back on one's life and uh, it's quite informative as well so you can go to the next one uh, this one is a bit controversial uh, this guy magnus Risch, is also a bit controversial but there are bits in this book which are quite useful um, it's relatively recent it's within the last year or so but he uh, it's based on his PhD on the subject. Uh, he's done a massive amount of market data research and so on, and I've used some diagrams in this talk if we get to them. Um, I would really read this critically. There's bits of it that are super useful, but it's also, um, it can be a little bit depressing as well um, uh, in terms of how he refers to artists and also galleries and so on. But um, it's kind of interesting to kind of get an overview of, of the art world and the art market as well. So you can go to the next one, Aslak. I think uh, this one is in the library at Comde, and uh, this is probably one of the better um, books. Unfortunately, it's kind of mainly referring to the uh, American art, art context. Uh, actually, both of them are as well, because there's a lot of stuff in dollars, and, he, and Raish has interviewed a lot of... Um, uh, gallery since one in New York. Um, uh, so, but th this is very informative. It's quite um, dense in a way. There's a lot of information in there uh, covering things like preparing your portfolio, consignment agreements, um, yeah, uh, archiving your work, all the things that I'm going to be touching on in, in the, this talk. So, next one. Okay, so. Um, the, I've divided this up into like eight uh, key points around uh, portfolio presentation and we'll get it, uh, into it in a bit more detail 
when uh, Laurie and uh, David uh, do their presentations. Um, and I'll also explain, because the after Laurie and, and David's presentations, we're gonna have a sort of in conversation, which will be a little bit of a mixture between a normal artist and conversation that you would have after an artist presentation or an artist exhibition, but also where I'm gonna ask a few uh, questions from the perspective of a collector or a curator or a gallerist. So I'll sort of, I'm not gonna put a hat on, but uh, that type of thing. Um, so uh, a lot of these things are very, um, very kind of basic and kind of common sense, but it's important to to follow through them every time you're kind of putting together a portfolio. And sometimes until you get into the rhythm of doing it, um, I mean, we were stretching canvas today and there's like a, a folds that you sort of do in the corner and it's second nature to me now because I just fold them, but actually it's quite complicated to kind of figure it out the first few times and practice makes perfect. So with a lot of these portfolio presentations, you know, you'll make the mistakes at the start You'll, I mean, I still make mistakes. There'll be typos in there and so on. So it's not about creating something perfect or you have to sort of find your own, own way through it. And I'll explain that during, during the presentation. So this is a key point here is read the criteria closely. Every open call has its own set of requirements for a portfolio. Take a close look at what each one you apply for is requesting from applicants, how many pieces, what format, size of files, when it's due and so on. Make sure your portfolio submission meets every requirement. So you just need to, if it's an open call, um, you need to really look through those um, uh, requirements and uh, kind of pick out, okay, 10 slides, has to be a five megabyte uh, PDF file, uh, only one work on each slide, but can use details, uh, can submit uh, QuickTime movie files and MP4 files. All these different things that you'll find in Culture Roads, and uh, uh, a lot of the big uh, open submission exhibitions. A lot of them will be quite similar, but you need to kind of um, be really careful not to just take it for granted and the day before uh, sort of uh, put together a previous portfolio because you might find that there are issues there. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so. Um, I just took uh, a few uh, uh, screenshots from portfolios that were online. I just randomly searched for artist portfolios. So most of these portfolios, I don't actually know the artists and I'm not going to be super critical of their work. So, uh, and there's no right way of doing these things, but I'm just gonna kind of pick out a few things. Also, I haven't chosen any really bad portfolios. And in a way there isn't a really bad portfolio uh, you can't really make a really bad portfolio because you are making your own portfolio to describe your own work so you're you're the boss basically but sometimes they maybe don't communicate in a clear way or they maybe don't um, uh, get across uh, the work in a clear way and that can often be done to artists trying to be designers um, and uh, portfolios have to be quite dry and quite boring uh, in a way and just kind of do what they, they are supposed to do. So um, you, this is just a, a cover sheet, but a, it's a landscape portfolio. So you set it up as landscape portfolio. That's actually a good idea because if you think about it, a lot of the um, uh, presentations or open submission um, juries will be looking at things on a projector or on a flat screen together now, there will be exceptions to this. You might have uh, a jury carrying around uh, a tablet uh, and kind of, especially if it's also in the submissions also including actual works, uh, but you can turn a tablet on its side as well. So when you're making a portfolio, if it's a submission, for example, to MB Co, to Culture Road, I would suggest uh, having it landscape format rather than portrait format. Uh, now, you can still make portrait format uh, PDFs because they'll be more useful to print out A4 format if you want to give somebody a hard copy or to print a sort of small publication. So quite a lot of this is about as you develop your archive of your ap application material, you're kind of constructing folders of different types of portfolios of different lengths. And especially if you get into like a routine of applying to MBCO every year, or applying to Culture Road when you have an exhibition, 
you can begin to um, use an InDesign document and um, I would suggest InDesign, but I mean, of course you can do it in Word and then export it as a PDF or you can use other, other software. Um, but you would use a, a document that then you can edit and change over time rather than having to start from scratch all the time. But again, it's important to look at the criteria specific to that open call that you're working with. So we can go to the next slide. So this is the same artist and um, he's decided to bleed the work right out to the edge. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, maybe when you're printing this out, it uses up a lot of ink. So I would do it for a digital submission rather than a, a kind of one that you're going to print out because you also have to think of the, the costs of some of these things. Um, I think the titling he's got here is a little bit intrusive, uh, but it, <laughs> the good thing is it's clear. Um, uh, on the previous slide, uh, he uh, had all his address, his email, his website, and everything was, was all in order. And I think it's very important to um, have a, a kind of a, uh, have all the important data, important information on it. Uh, but I wouldn't, some, I'm not going to show examples of that, uh, but uh, I wouldn't put the CV first. You want to uh, have a cover page perhaps, uh, if, it's, if it's a submission to a gallery and so on, and then have the CV at the end. Some people kind of front load their CV in a portfolio and that uh, I, I don't think sends out the right message and you want to start with the work and then people use that as, as a kind of a appendix in a way. Um, so maybe if I was him, I would uh, kind of maybe reduce the image a little bit in size, have a white band down the bottom here and maybe the, the title down here uh, in a more simple way. But of course, um, you know, when you, you're printing out some things like this, it might become difficult to read. So you have to kind of get a balance between how it looks on the screen, how it looks in an actual printed copy if you're going to print it out. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so organize your examples effectively. Um, the way you arrange the different pieces in your portfolio reflects on your presentation skills and thought process. If you're conscientious about the order in which your work is presented, the selection panel or gallery will be able to better understand your artistic practice and the ideas behind your work. So you're really going to um, think about uh, the sequencing, and that can be chronological. Uh, it can be that you uh, start with um, earlier works and kind of go through, um, but probably it's a good idea to start with your most recent work and then maybe have some examples of your work. Uh, depending on the different um, uh, open submissions, um, for example, I would say for uh, Culture Road and, uh, in, well, we're slightly different, but uh, so let's take MBCO first. For MBCO, if you're applying for that, you need to focus on, if it's your first time applying, of course, uh, focus on uh, your practice as broadly as possible, but again, don't, you know, if it's a 20-year career or whatever, don't try and pack everything in because you'll have a, a, have a limited amount, so stick to, the, stick to the requirements. But I would also suggest that you um, uh, focus on the most current work and then maybe have a few examples of earlier work. So you're talking, uh, say you have a 15, 20 year career, you're talking about focusing on the most recent five year period. M unless you want to kind of contextualize your own practice with some earlier works, some earlier kind of key works, but have the, the most of them um, uh, focusing on the, the current work. And that, what panels, especially when you're applying for stipends, uh, the, the panels when they're looking at them, they're not going to um, some, sometimes they'll know uh, or, or have seen your work before and if you're applying uh, a year after you applied the time before and it's exactly the same portfolio then that's a problem because they'll see uh, that there you know maybe you get award the year before but then you apply again and they, then there's no progression or no shows or whatever there it's a competitive uh, uh, process so you uh, I think it's probably about a third of people uh, applying Get, get a grant of some sort. So you need to be um, kind of strategic. So in a way, if you haven't produced a lot of new work, maybe it's better to skip a year and or apply for sort of a smaller sum and, and so on. With Culture Road, it's a bit different because they tend to be more project-based, uh, although there are stipends, but um, 
the, if you're applying for a project, then I would apply with a portfolio that describes your project in a very, very clear way, but also gives work that backs up that application. So if you work in a diverse way like me, and I'm applying for a sculptural installation that involves interactivity, I wouldn't put all my paintings in, for example. I would just focus on that aspect of my practice. It sounds like it's not being representative, but it's just being strategic and sensible and not trying to muddy the water with showing too much different stuff. So we can go to the next one. So all of these uh, uh, presentations are absolutely fine, um, but I would suggest with this one, uh, I mean, again, it's up to people themselves, but I, I would reduce the installation shot a little bit and then have this um, given a little bit more uh, space because of course this is a detail from here, or if there's enough room, just have an installation shot and then have the detail slides on the following slide. You know, so rather than trying to pack it all in into one portfolio, just be a bit more uh, careful with your work and don't sort of, um, I mean, it's, it's fine to do a bit of graphic design and say if you're doing an artist publication and so on and you want to kind of have, uh, you know, for, for example, that poster over there, the text is on top, you can kind of play around with your work. That suits for a poster or maybe for an artist publication, as an artist book or something. But with portfolios, it's very important to try and keep it as clean and clear as possible. It sounds a bit boring, but I wouldn't have like little icons and uh, we were talking about unicorns, you know, don't stick a load of unicorns on each page or whatever, you know, just keep it very, very, very simple and very uh, clear and boring, I guess, but <laughs> boring is good with portfolios. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, write clear and concise labels. Most open calls will want some basic information about the images in your portfolio. A title, date, and description of the medium are standard. If more information is requested, elaborate without being excessive. Um, I think it's, it's really nice to have um, information when it's needed. So if you're, if you're um, uh, submitting in your portfolio a complex installation that is, uh, comprises of several components, just describe them in a, in a very clear way, but don't get overly wordy with them. Um, it's also good to... So if you're doing a portfolio for a gallery, which is some, something that, uh, like say, they, they're interested about your work and they want to see more, or sometimes a curator will ask for extra material, um, then it's fine to have a, you know, an artist statement at the front, maybe some information about the work, a uh, cover page, of course, and then the actual works themselves with descriptions. Um, but when you're applying for things like stipends or open calls, they tend to have the text in another uh, part of the, the application. So you have your artist statement, a short statement, then you have a longer text and there's sort of submitted in forms and then you have the documentation, your budget, all these other types of things. Uh, so don't repeat the things, you know, make sure you take that material out of a portfolio if you're applying for a, sta a stipend, uh, but it may be suitable to use in an app application uh, that, uh, you know, a gallery has requested a portfolio. Um, yep, we'll go to the next one. So this is kind of a little bit uh, so uh, excessive. This was another portfolio, so he's got uh, a solo exhibition above, a lot about the exhibition, tons of images. Actually, in other parts of his uh, portfolio, it was um, quite uh, clear and nice, and there were some slides that were, were really good, but this is kind of trying to pack too many things in. Of course, you could say aesthetically, maybe it sort of fits with the work and so on, but I would say that it, it kind of becomes a, a kind of confusing statement about the work. But again, this is all subjective. You know, you can disagree with me and we can have a conversation about different uh, approaches and so on, and uh, that's absolutely fine. So maybe a few too many images, also uh, a lot of text, uh, which is not necessarily giving information about the individual works or the installation shots, but just kind of going into the, the content of the exhibition. So, um, next one. Again, this is the same artist and uh, it's uh, good. He's got like uh, the photo credits down below, uh, information. It's portrait uh, format again, so maybe as you see, we're losing the space here and losing the space there when it's projected. Um, but, uh, you know, he could have got away with a few less images, maybe four images instead of however many that are on here. So we can go to the next one. 
Um, this is a really clear, concise um, uh, image slide from a portfolio. It's got the, the title of the work here, 2011, the materials and the size, and also describing that it's actually curved, uh, a curved installation. Um, and then you have the title above. Uh, what's kind of good about this is that if you print this out, um, this text is quite small, maybe a little bit difficult to read when it's on a page like this, but this text is quite large so that there's, you get the title, the most, most information there. Um, so maybe if you've got sort of smaller text, it becomes like, uh, difficult to read when it's, when it's printed out. The one thing I would say is that if this was printed out, then it doesn't have the artist's name on it. But that's not necessarily a big problem because I wouldn't like put your name on every slide um, because it's just going to kind of get excessive in sort of like a design aspect of it. So, I mean, it's a trade-off because maybe the this page gets lost in the gallery and something and then they can't figure out which artist has submitted and so on and so forth. But I think it's a, a risk worth uh, taking. You can go to the next slide. Uh, be ready to discuss each piece. This is uh, really only relevant if you're approached by uh, a gallery or uh, somebody to do a public commission or something like that because um, when you're applying to MBCO or to uh, Culture Road or to any open calls, it normally doesn't involve any sort of meeting with the uh, curators or the, the jury panel. Um, it's all uh, basically done behind scenes and then you get the notification, you probably won't even get that much feedback either. Um, but whether it's during a studio visit, a portfolio presentation, or even in an email, you may have to answer questions or explain parts of your work. And you don't need to memorize these, but it's important to uh, understand the details of each selection and revisit the works. So if you're submitting something and you, know, you, you kind of feel uncomfortable about an earlier work and you maybe don't really want to talk about it, but you have sort of submitted it, then maybe don't submit it. But the, the thing is that uh, also, um, you know, the, the person who you're meeting with might have a different perspective on the, on the portfolio uh, and, and the work submitted, so they might ask you certain questions that you're not, uh, not that you're not really comfortable with, but that might sort of catch you off guard. And just be prepared, I mean, we all are experts of our own work, so it's not a, not a problem to kind of just uh, make those kind of critical decisions. Um, but it's, it's good in a reflective process to go back and remember what you were doing, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the kind of reflective process of, of looking back at your work and seeing how it relates to the, the current work. Um, yep, you can go to the next one. Okay, so tell stories. Uh, showcasing a range of your artistic practice is important, but you should also include works in your portfolio that show your storytelling skills. Think about the deeper meaning of each example. If you can tie this meaning to specific experience or unique attribute that sets you apart from other applicants even better. So, you know, um, we all have our own kind of approach to our work. Uh, Brandon LaBelle would call it the sovereignty of the artist. So we're all kind of um, the, the leaders of our own kind of little, little kingdoms uh, where we're making our, our practice. And, and just be prepared to tell that story, whether it involves some autobiographical material, if it's relevant, or maybe whether it, it talks about the work uh, in a specific way that is key to you, maybe about the materials you use, the kind of uniqueness of, of the, the format and, and, and maybe colors and, and so on and so forth. But try to just focus in on, on what makes your work unique to you and uh, makes it appealing to um, to be, to be uh, collected or uh, shown or whatever. So we'll go to the next one. So this is just a section from Eva Brandes' um, portfolio. I think it's a really good um, uh, artist statement, uh, just explaining um, the background to her work and also then including the website for further information. This will be in the PDF, so there's no, no point reading it out, uh, but it's also quite a nice, nice layout. Don't get hung up on quantity. Less is more as long as you generally meet the minimum requirements mentioned in the open call application. You shouldn't be overly concerned about how many works are in your portfolio. More pieces could help, but not at the expense of standards of quality. The same goes for including older artworks. Only include a few high quality ones and mainly focus on works produced in the last two to five years unless there's specific reading reasons. I've kind of said that already. So we'll go to the next one. Um, 
Again, here's another example where there's kind of layering up the images, so I would probably suggest to uh, work with a different format of the images and kind of rearrange it, but you sort of get to get the message. It's to, the simpler the better, rather than trying to sort of arrange uh, things in lots of, lots of different ways. But this is kind of interesting because it's important to show that these are interactive pieces so that they can be touched by the public and interacted with, with people, whereas these two don't necessarily give that information, but they also show the formal qualities of the work. So maybe keeping this one in and dispensing with one of those, even though this is a, a detail. Okay, we can go to the next one. This is a bit of a kind of a confused portfolio. Um, it's probably absolutely fine. It seems to be kind of half homepage, half uh, portfolio. It's quite nice sometimes to include um, studio shots in the portfolio if it's, if it's relevant and if you're kind of trying to show your process. But I wouldn't use it as a kind of backing uh, background, faded background to the image as well. Um, and then also wouldn't use these sort of icons and so on at the bottom. It's maybe good to have numbers on the pages, but uh, I probably wouldn't use them because the PDF already is um, uh, a kind of self-contained unit when you're applying as a digital uh, form. But maybe if you're doing a printout, it could be good to have it. Yeah, five minutes. We'll go to the next one. A uh, few too many works, less is more. Next one. Um, get outside advice. Now this is really key. Um, your uh, colleagues, when you, you know, for all of you that are students, your colleagues as, as students, they're all your network, your friends, your resources. Talk to each other, be generous with each other, share, uh, be constructively critical. The same goes for, for artists who have graduated. You know, uh, become part of an artist collective. You know, use your, your family to critique what you're what you're doing, get people to proofread it, you know, uh, talk to people, don't feel that you're alone. I mean, sometimes it feels like we're all competing with each other, but if you go back to this idea of everybody producing unique individual works uh, from a unique individual perspective, it actually means that it's not really about that competing, uh, even if you're applying for the same stipends, because the way the, the cookie will crumble will actually be determined by what the actual uh, jury is looking for and uh, the quality of the work and so on. So just be generous with each other and, and use your network once you graduate. Also form artist collectives and, and use that opportunity to, to talk to each other and help each other uh, along the way. Really just proofreading and reading artist statements and even writing things for each other is really good. Uh, it's easy to get boxed in your own percep perception, let it cloud your judgment, and then seeking advice and opinions on your work from a trusted artist, colleague, or advice, an advisor will broaden your perspective and help you see your portfolio in a new light. Um, some artist organizations offer portfolio advice for their members, and attending one of these sessions is a great way to get input on your portfolio. So I don't know if this does some... Uh, We're doing it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Go. Uh, so this is um, here, another uh, section from Ava Brandes' um, portfolio and what she's done here, she's shown two works from a series of works and I think this is kind of a nice way to um, show that uh, it's part of a larger body of work but again it's very clear and uh, I mean it's up to kind of personal preference whether you go with uh, serif or sans serif or all of these different things, Arial or Helvetica, Times New Roman, it's up to, up to the individual. So we'll go to the next one. Test your portfolio. So this actually is a really good way to see the images. I've already noticed uh, problems with my presentation because I grab things from the internet. They're pixelated. There's a couple of books there that were pixelated. Um, you know, you, you shouldn't sort of think, oh, it looks fine on my little laptop screen. It's ready, it's good to go test it, uh, try it on projectors, try it on tablets, try it on mobile phones. I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, I have my portfolio ready weeks before uh, I do an application. It's not like that at all. I, I'm just like anybody else. I um, kind of apply on the, you know, at the last moment, work up late hours and, and so on. So that's, that's not what I'm talking about. But it's really good to test these things out as much as possible. And especially if you get into a routine, then it starts to be a bit easier. Um, try using a digital projector like this, checking the images look the same as on your computer because quite often maybe on the computer they, a dark image looks quite clear and then you put it up on a projector and you can't see anything. Um, test your PDFs, readability on laptops, tablets and smartphones 
and make sure to check what the file size should be if the open call asks for a 5 megabyte PDF, don't try and send a 25 megabyte file. Try to open your file on a PC if you use a Mac and vice versa because they might be using PCs and you might be applying on a Mac. Next one. Um, okay, I'll try and rush, can I rush through this a little bit? Yeah. So. Um, We've got, I probably won't get to the consignment agreements, but I'll sh t show you what it looks like. And it's on, um, the one I've used as an example is on the Danish Art Association website uh, because it's a really good um, uh, consignment agreement template. And, um, you know, maybe at a later date we can actually go through that in, in relation to uh, working with galleries as well. So we go to the next. So, um, I'll r try and rush through this a bit because um, it's quite common sense when you when you work it out. But you're going to be costing and, and pricing your work. The two separate but interrelated processes. So many artists focus on finding the right price for their work, but this can't be done in the absence of knowing how much it costs to make. So an example would be you've got tons of overheads because you're working with gold, for example. Um, and you uh, then sell a work for a cheap price and uh, you're, not, you're, you're running at a deficit all the time, so you're not making any profit. So you need to kind of figure out, okay, what are my costs? What are the costs of making the work, the time, all of these different things? And then you need to somehow feed that back into uh, the pricing of your practice. And that doesn't necessarily just mean uh, your um, your art practice in relation to selling work. This can be if you're doing workshops, if you're doing public commissions, if you're doing talks, if you're doing teaching, all of these things can kind of be, be put into that. Um, so you're costing your practice, you're costing your time, and you're costing your project. So we'll go to the next one. So costing your time, um, ways to calculate the cost of your time, itemize the annual overheads of your practice, itemize your personal expenses, itemize the number of actual days that you're available to work. We can go to the next one. This is an example here. So my annual expenses are 20,000 euro. This is not me, this is just a fictional character. Uh, my personal expenses are 10,000 euro. My total expenses are 30,000 euro, 200 working days a year, 30,000 divided by 200. Minimum fee per working day is 150 euro. Okay, so it's really straightforward when you start to pick it out. Of course, that doesn't mean that you're going to be working per working day um, uh, every working day, but it just means that you're actually costing your practice in relation to that. So then if you have your artworks on top of that, so maybe you do um, a fee of 100, well, you probably need to add more to the 150 uh, because that's very cheap for a working day, but at least it shows you, okay, if I work these number of days, um, if I work every day of the year, and then I'm going to uh, break even. Uh, 150 per working day is the minimum fee I must earn in order to break even. Remember, this break even figure of 150 per day is the minimum I must earn to maintain my practice and lifestyle. Once I start making work, incurring an expenditure, my expenses will increase, my income must also increase. Okay, next one. Um, then, in terms of pricing your work, um, you establish all these different things and you have to kind of interrelate them in a little bit uh, in a certain way. And this is all a process, so don't freak out and think, oh my God, I've got to do all this kind of work. And it's, it's something that you can just reflect on over time and you can develop. And I'm gonna show you a really simple way of pricing your work, but it's also good to reflect on some of these things as you begin to uh, submit your tax returns, all of those different, different things. So, there's several factors that you need to take into consideration uh, in terms of your work. So they, they um, include originality, quality, uniqueness, costs incurred, your break-even point, your reputation, your objective in making the work, and whether or not you work in one-offs or multiples. Okay, next one. This is what Magnus um, Reich says. So, Similar thing, materials, time spent, size, motif, quality, addition size, and your resume. So your resume is basically where, what point in you, you are in your career. And I'm gonna show you a simple system that actually helps that. Next one. This is what he also does here. Um, the, this is kind of roughly okay. So what he's talking about here is like a 60 by 60 centimeter uh, work. And it should be five hundred to two thousand dollars, depending on what scale of uh, emerging artist you are. But then, if you become a 
a senior artist, uh, like I guess I'm becoming, or maybe I already am, um, then you're talking more like a thousand to four thousand dollars, and that's also reflected in your resume in terms of like all the experience you've done and so on. Then large, two thousand to five thousand dollars, and they're they're roughly okay figures in terms of what I would would estimate. Um, this is actually quite a good. Uh, a piece of advice, lots of stuff in the book isn't so such good advice, but I think it's good to sort of say, this is my price, and then let the person decide. Go next. Uh, so you need to research your market, and this will depend very much on your area of practice. It's important to maintain price integrity, i.e. a buyer should not purchase a piece and find out a month later that your prices have gone down. Never put your prices down. Um, uh, or they could have bought your work elsewhere at a cheaper price. That's a big no-no as well. Uh, of course, there'll be differences in relation to um, uh, currency exchange, and that's unavoidable, but definitely don't have prices at different prices in different galleries. Uh, the gap between your break-even figure and the price of your work depends on all the factors outlined above and can only be tried and tested on market factors. So if you find that it's, uh, if you put like the prices too high for certain works, then that can be a problem and that happens to some people as well. So just be mindful of that. But there are certain ways you can kind of aug augment that in a way. So this next section, which I'll finish up on, you can go to the next one. This is the factor system. So this is a system that was developed by a gallerist in uh, Germany, I think, probably back in the 70s. And it's a really simple system that a lot of German gallerists use and a lot of German um, collectors know about it. And I think most galleries internationally will know about it as well. And I find it super useful. It's not perfect. It, um, for example, with paintings and probably with other media as well, once you go up in scale, it starts the price for the work starts to seem uh, relatively too low in a way. So in a way, you almost need to operate with a factor for big works and a factor for small works. So that's kind of what's worked out for me uh, when I'm working with really big paintings. But if you're working with relatively small to medium paintings um, or small to medium installations or sculptures, then it, it should work absolutely fine. So it's um, the height of a painting plus the width of a painting by the factor. And that equals the price of the artwork in euro. So I think it was developed for maybe the the Deutsche Mark at a certain point, and then it became the Euro. So I don't know how that figured out, but it seems to work absolutely fine with the Euro. So you have to convert it into Euro, and then convert it into Danish kroner, Norwegian kroner, dollars, whatever. Um, of course, you could probably figure out your own factor system that is based on the Danish kroner or the Norwegian kroner, but that uh, would be too complicated for my brain to deal with right now. Um, the factor, so for an example here, you've got a hundred, uh, by 100 centimeter, one meter by one meter canvas. You add the two together, you get 200, and then you multiply it by factor 15, and you get 3,000 euro. Around uh, about uh, factor 10, 11, 9, 10, 11, 12, I would say is probably a good price, and it seems to be backed up by some of these other books and so on, a good price for a uh, bachelor student into an MA, a recently graduated MA student, but it all depends on the work and lots of other different things. The factor is determined by staging an art career and goes up in relation to career development. It never goes down, just like the prices never go down. But you could, um, and this could also help you if you've suddenly put like too high prices and you're finding that your work isn't selling, you could actually have factors on key works that are higher, basically if you don't want to sell them. So you can kind of like say, okay, I'm going to put one painting at factor 70. I don't do that, but um, it's, it's entirely possible to just say, I don't want to sell this work, so I'm going to put it so high, and that's my price, and that's it. Um, factor system can also be used for sculpture installation. You just add an extra dimension, the, the depth of the, of the sculpture, uh, to the formula, and video and animation, you just add duration. Uh, and, and figure out the factor that way. Also, whether the video is a multiple or, or whatever. Factor can also be adjusted to suit additions and drawings, marks on paper. So you just reduce the factor. So you might have a factor of 12 for your paintings, and then you also do prints, and they're additioned, and then you have a, a lower factor, you know, maybe factor five or something like that for, for those. And the good thing about this is that if somebody say you make a new series of works on a format or size that you've never used before, you can just really quickly get a, a guesstimate from the factor that's also in relation to all the other works. 
Um, it also means that if somebody is, uh, you meet a, somebody that wants to commission a work and they like want to know a price or whatever, then you can also calculate it super quick on your, on your smartphone. You can go to the next one and then we can finish up in a few seconds. Sorry for the blurry slide. <laughs> it's, I photographed it today from the book. Um, this is Susan and Michael Hort collectors and they, this kind of backs up the, the system. They say $6,000 to $7,000 uh, or less and it's also backed up by market research. Um, so that, that this should be a kind of guiding principle for young artists. We can go to the next slide. Um, and I've done an example based on that. So you can actually find out what another artist's factor is. So if you find the price of their work, say on Artsy or in an online showroom or whatever, you can actually figure out from that by doing this. So you find out the factor, you add the, the dimensions together, you divide the price by 400 and then you get factor 13. And it's an okay start for a recently graduated master's student, which also fits with what um, the Horts say. But you have to take into consideration all the other elements. And I think maybe the next one's the last slide. Um, yeah, so this is a, also from the Magnus Reich book, and he's talking about um, the majority of online buyers spend less than $5,000 annually in art galleries, and the average price for contemporary artwork in 2018 was 9335 If you are selling your work straight from the studio, then buyers may expect to, to, to be half the price that it would be quoted by the galleries. That's not a good idea, but as a young artist, maybe you can do that before you start being represented by a gallery. Um, at auction, 92% of the works are priced below 50,000 and 70 uh, percent or under 5,000. So it kind of gives you an idea of what, you know, the, the bigger the price, the more or the least people that can buy it, which is kind of stands to reason. So that was it. Sorry for going a bit over time. And are there any questions? Mm. Sorry. I just got, uh, there's tons of other slides, but sorry, Anna. Of course, it's, uh, you don't think to compare your work with other artists? Yeah, yeah. Like prints, for instance? Yeah, 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 you can do that. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so you can go to um, Artsy, for example. A lot of the prices are on there mm -hmm. online. Uh, you can go into some of the galleries. So, for example, if there's a gallery that you visit and you like, and you're also interested in the artists that they represent, you know, just go and look and see if you can find an, an artist who's at a similar stage in, in the career. And that's also a good way of sort of seeing what what the price could be, um, but it's very important to um, not uh, you know you shouldn't have to pay uh, for for example when you're working with a gallery you shouldn't the artist shouldn't have to pay anything even though because when you're working with a gallery you're getting you've got a fifty percent you get fifty percent of the artist uh, the gallery gets fifty percent so. Forty in Norway, but not necessarily um, across the board. So with commercial galleries, all of them. Yeah, because yeah. uh, I mean, Aslak was just saying that Magnus Reich is suggesting the gallery should get seventy percent in order for the model to be realistic. So um, it's crazy. Um, you know, it's, it's, the galleries will probably say that, but you know, it's, it tends to be fifty-fifty. Yeah. You have a question as well. Yep. Uh, let's say. Price of work from a perspective, some from the director from the studio, yeah. and then some will become represented by a gallery. Yeah. Should the price then be double because the gallery will be? Uh, <coughs> or how do you? I mean, when you move into that, I mean, uh, and the gallery is taking on the work and taking on the Yeah. Uh, it's it's a complicated one because there's also examples of uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist support pledge. Uh, which started off, it's on Instagram and it's something that started off in the UK um, uh, during the pandemic and um, it's basically where you post images of your work and you put uh, a maximum price of 2,000 kroner or 200 euro or 200 pounds and um, you sell your work through Instagram and then your pledge is that when, um, when you sell, I think it's four or five works, mm -hmm. then you buy another artist's work from like, it doesn't have to be an artist pledge, I don't think, but you could you just buy another artist's work for uh, the same price. So it's, it's about kind of putting money and it's become a kind of multi-million business. Mm -hmm. But I think you, it's, it's fine to do it as a young artist um, and also to support yourself. 
but it's important to not undersell yourself. I mean, you could probably take a painting and say it would be a gallery price 400 pounds, and then because you're, you're getting uh, the, the full price, like say if you're showing the gallery, you would miss the 50%. You could maybe sort of for a bunch of works, like a, like maybe five or 10 works, you could say, okay, these ones I'm gonna sell on the artist support pledge and I'll stick to this and then you, and you advertise them like that. But I wouldn't kind of go overboard with it. It's probably better for prints and editions and drawings and, and things like that. But then if a gallery comes along, they're not gonna be so happy if you're selling works on Instagram and they're gonna, or from your studio. But it also depends on, I think you have to fight for your own rights also as an artist. So you um, need to, so say for example, um, you're selling quite well on Instagram, a gallery in New York comes across your work uh, via Instagram, for example, and then they say they want to represent you globally and they want you to stop selling work on Instagram. They have to come with something. I wouldn't just take that as like, wow, I'm gonna be represented by a gallery in New York. I would like, it would be a negotiation and it might risk losing that, that opportunity, but I think that's a risk worth taking to, to actually sort of uh, hold your ground because maybe you want to see how it goes with that gallery. You know, um, the other part of the talk I was going to do was kind of going into gallery ranking and artist ranking and all this kind of AI and stuff, which is also really scary, but it is also something that we as artists can use to our own benefit because we there's a, a lot more market transparency so you can actually compare one gallery off another with different data that you can find and see is this a better gallery than this gallery and sort of uh, make your decisions there because quite often you know you just go like wow a gallery wants to show me you know so it's it's, it's really good to be able to kind of treat it ob objectively especially if you've got a certain amount of choice but just to your uh, question, because I did not actually answer the question at the start, um, um, it's really um, important to do the pricing of the work because within reason, I would say yes, it would be okay if you're selling the work at a cheaper price uh, and then you, because it actually fits with the factor system in a way. Yeah, because I noticed that there's like 100% yeah. Gallery, so. yeah, because if you, the way the factor system works actually is that when you have a kind of key moment in your career, so let's say you get a big prize, then you can put your factor up. Now normally if you were working with a gallery, that would be a decision, a business decision that you would make together. And say you were doing a, like a solo show with the gallery after doing a big commission or getting a prize or so on. The gallery could say uh, that my artist factor is going up, uh, but uh, I'm gonna give all you collectors, my special collectors, uh, a special private view of the works and you can buy them at the old factor right before they sell now that's a way of avoiding paying discounts because you're giving a kind of preemptive discount so it's a kind of good gallery strategy to kind of suddenly sell the sell the show out before it's actually uh, so the collectors will think that they're getting a good deal because the work's going up and already if they're a collector that's interested in uh, an investment then they're already making money as it were even though it's all completely yeah, hoopla. <laughs> uh, so, so the, these type of things, but you know, don't double the price and then suddenly end up with a price that's just totally unrealistic. You know, but the fact that you would be joining a gallery, and if the gallery is like a very, like say David Zwerner knocks on your door and, and says, uh, "I'd like to represent you," then your factor could go through the roof potentially, uh, or you could double it up definitely because. That, that gallery has a reputation, which means that your factor can go up. You know, yeah. is that clear? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? That's fine. Uh, we we did discuss this, but prices in different countries. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about this? Uh, some artists have higher prices in some some areas. Yeah, I, I personally don't think it's a good idea, but um, uh, so I, I don't do that. I mean, there is maybe, again, if the currency exchange, um, uh, I would just put up the prices. You know, if you're, like, for example, recently, um, I started showing again for a gallery in, in Zurich in Switzerland, and um, uh, some of my bigger scale works were, um, the galleries felt that they were too low. Um, and I hadn't put my factor up for quite a while, so it just felt fine to put those works up in price and just keep the other ones kind of 
uh, remind me what they were. Um, but I do that across the board, so I notify the galleries in Denmark and in America if uh, these prices have gone up. I do give them a little bit of wiggle room <laughs> so that they might be able to make a deal with one of their collectors or something. I'm not going to say put it up right tomorrow kind of thing, but um, you know that's, that type of thing is fine. But I wouldn't, I think it's dodgy in a way to sell at higher prices in, in one country than the other. But of course, as your work, your career develops, you're going to be pricing people out. You know, if you become super successful and sell a lot of works at, a, at higher and higher prices, then you're not going to be uh, affordable by uh, maybe people that started following you. But they're going to probably feel quite good about the investment they made, I guess. Yeah, Amy. This is something to do with the international Mm -hmm. Price as well, and I completely understand about having the price the same place. But somewhere like America, mm. they're prepared to pay a lot more money yeah. for, especially artist books, yeah. than Europe. Yeah. So you get a real difficulty of putting a, a low price here or a high price in America. Yeah. It's, it's then very difficult to put the same price in Europe. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think artist books are particular type of situation um, and uh, I, I guess it depends where your market is you know if you if you have a big market in America then maybe you can kind of actually afford to to neglect uh, Europe and um, then the prices can be at the higher level and it just becomes a kind of business decision in a way but if you have 50 50 like a lot selling in Europe and a lot selling in America I mean, there's, there are things like um, shipping and, and so on and so forth. So because you're based in Europe, then you could actually argue that those prices, because of all the organization to get there, but I mean, that wouldn't put the prices up massively. And of course, they would probably have to pay for the shipping anyway. Um, so yeah, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one. There's no real answer. And I think you just kind of take it as a case by case basis. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. So, thank you.